Well, good morning, church family. Uh, me and my family are also going to Belize. When Josh said spring break Belize, I'm like, I am going. We are going, but it's not to party, but to do mission journey and would invite you to come with us. As Josh said, there was another family that signed up just this morning, so I'd love for you to come with us in this to help the people in Belize understand the gospel of Jesus. Let me invite you to turn now to Genesis chapter 3. As Josh has just mentioned, where we'll be this morning, Genesis chapter 3. I uh, should just take you just a second to find it, but uh, I want to make sure you're aware of this. I know you've heard of a lot of announcements that are, that are coming up, but there's one that's coming up within an hour. Uh, it's a welcome reception for those of you who are fairly new to the church, maybe want to know more about the life of the church, what's going on, what West Franklin's about. Uh, I want to invite you to that. The staff, some of our spouses will be, will be present. Uh, we'd love to meet you. There is a warm meal being provided, Waldo's chicken and water. <laughs> kind of scared that y'all knew that wasn't that. But um, um, that is after, be immediately following this service in the fellowship hall uh, directly behind us here. All right, Genesis chapter 3. If you've been reading the Bible through this year, you're like, well, I finished Genesis 29 yesterday. I mean, for crying out loud, we're going all the way back. Well, yes, um, as I mentioned last week, we are preaching through the Bible. We're going to do our best to pick some of the highlights. So you cannot preach through the Bible, in my opinion, without looking a little closer at Genesis 3. But never fear, next week, God willing, if we get to come out of our igloos, we will be looking at Genesis chapter 37. So we're going to make a major leap between this week and next week. So that's coming. Hopefully you found Genesis 3. We're going to start by looking at one verse. So let me invite you to stand with me and look with me in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. We'll be looking at a lot of other verses here, but uh, let's start with just this one. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. Father, would you, by the power of your spirit, help us grasp this thing we really don't like to talk about much. But all of us are eat up with it. Help us to understand a little bit more about this world we live in and why we sin. And what happens to those who do sin. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As I do with all passages um, during the week, I just kind of camp out in the passage I'm going to be preaching on on the upcoming Sunday spend a lot of time. And if you know anything about Genesis 3, it's the chapter where sin enters the world. So just a lot of mess, just a lot of sin sickness. So, oh, man, we live in a messed up world. Wednesday afternoon, however, about 4 o'clock, my phone starts buzzing and beeping. I start getting text messages, links to articles. And I thought, you know, maybe this world isn't as bad as I think it is. Nick Saban retired, <laughs> and my phone just blew up. I was just like, this, <laughs> maybe it's not this bad. I mean, the clouds parted, birds started to sing. I imagined myself in this green field with daisies, and just, just anyway, it was fantastic. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding about that. That was fantastic, but I, we, we live in a Genesis 3 world. But I do want to ask this. Why, why is this chapter here? Kind of a downer. Genesis 1 and 2 is so wonderful. Everything was perfect. I mean, sure, he recorded some historical facts, but there's tons of historical facts that happened from the time Adam and Eve were created until now that aren't recorded here. The authors were pretty choosy, had to be. So why? I've, I've heard Genesis 3 described as one of the most important chapters of the Bible. Why is it here? And I'm sure we could give hundreds of way, reasons probably, but I want to camp around three big ideas. 
There's three reasons I believe chapter, Genesis chapter 3 is here. Number one, to help us understand why this world is in the mess it's in. That's one reason Genesis 3 is here. To give understanding, to help us, help us process why is it like this? Perhaps you've watched the news and in your heart you've cried out, How long, oh Lord, is it going to be like this? That's a Genesis 3 type longing. The second reason I believe Genesis 3 is here is to give us an understanding of sin. Sin nature. Why we do it. How we do it. What transpires. Who, who's at fault. What's going on with, with, this, with this sin. As we just saw the first sin. We just read the first sin committed there in verse 6. And the third thing I want us to camp out on for just a moment before we leave. What does God do with such people? What does God do with his creatures that he created and they almost, at least according to the scriptures, immediately disobey him? How does God treat people, his creatures, that look at him and say, I don't want your way? We might need to know how God treats people that way, like that. So let's just take a few minutes to un unpack each of those first. I believe Genesis 3 is here just to give us a little bit of understanding of why the world is in the mess that it's in. I don't have to give you illustrations. I don't have to point to things. You know it. You feel it. You see it. The train has come off the rails. It's a mess. It's a wreck, which is kind of confusing because we read Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Everything was perfect. But now we know here in the year 2024, something happened and it's not right. Well, we know sin happened, and we see in Genesis chapter 3 that there are major consequences to sin, in particular, this first sin. Everything was perfect, Adam and Eve blew it, and immediate consequences for their sin. Now, we'll come back to the first sin in just a moment, but I want, I want you to put your eyes on verse 16 of chapter 3. This is after sin has entered the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve have disobeyed God, and now God is giving consequences to the woman and then to the man. He gives a consequence to the snake as well, which we'll look at later on. But for now, I want us to look at the consequence of the, uh, to, the, to the woman and to the man. Verse 16, Genesis 3, this is God speaking to Eve. He said to the woman... In other words, because you disobeyed, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And then he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you were dust, and you will return to dust. Thanks, Adam and Eve. Now, you, like me, may have several questions. What does it mean by that? What do I mean? Okay. Suffice it to say here, God is letting Adam and Eve and therefore us know that what was originally intended was beautiful, perfection, smooth, intimate love, joy, delight. And when sin entered the world, Everything changed. What God intended has now been marred. You, do you know that there's only four chapters in the Bible where sin is not an influence? Only four. Where Satan and evil and sin are not an influence. The first two chapters and the last two chapters. There's only four chapters in the entire Bible where sin is not playing a role. Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. And you know where we're living right now? In between those times. If you ever ask the question, why is the world like this? It's because sin has entered the world. You may not be able to answer specifics. Why did this happen? How did this happen? Why did God allow this happen? But the big answer is sin has entered the world and we live in a world marred by sin. In Romans 8, Paul speaks of this in a very unique way when he talks about creation. 
and what sin caused to happen in creation. Let me read it for you. It's in Romans 8, 21 and 22. Just listen to the language. He's talking about the redemption of things, but I want you to notice what he says about creation in verse 21. He says, the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. So creation after sin, that's Sin was, uh, excuse me, creation in 1 and 2 of Genesis was perfect. Sin entered the world. Now it's in bondage to decay. Look at what he says in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. He says creation's groaning. Why are there hurricanes? Creation's groaning. Why are there tornadoes? Creation's groaning. Why are there tsunamis? Because sin has entered the world. This is not what God intended. Why are there school shootings? Creation's groaning. Why is there war? Creation's groaning. Why is there cancer? Creation's groaning. It's not what was intended. Sin has caused it to happen. And so if you were to ask the question, why do we live in this sin sick world? The answer, or why do we live in this messed up world? The answer is sin. This isn't what God intended. It's not going to always be this way, but it is now. When you can't go outside for the next four days, blame sin. It's not supposed to be this cold. Not in Michigan. Second, why is Genesis 3 here? I believe to help us understand the nature of sin. To help us understand why. Have you ever asked yourself, why do, I, why do I keep doing this? Or maybe not you, but a friend. Why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep, ah, why does such and such act this way? Why do I act this way? Well, we get a pretty good description here in Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Because we get to put our eyes on Eve, but it's really a description of all of us. I've been tempted to blame Adam and Eve. So if y'all just hadn't blown it. But when I look over the past 46 years of my life on earth, my track record is very similar. Very similar. Before we get to verse 1 of chapter 3, however, I want to set it up by looking at something God told Adam at the end of chapter 2. Things are still perfect. And I want, I want, I want, many of you know this, but perhaps you've forgotten. Look at what God told Adam specifically in verse 15 of chapter 2. This is Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. Watch this. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Got it, Adam? I don't know if he said that. I don't know if Adam said got it, but God made it clear. Adam, look around. The whole Garden of Eden is yours. Everything here, you can have one tree. This middle one here. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Pretty clear, huh? Stay away from the tree or you'll die. By the way, death is another consequence to sin. Kind of a big deal. Turn the page to chapter 3, and you get this serpent. You think serpents are scary now. This one could walk and talk. (laughs) Verse 1. Let's see how sin happens. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That slithering piece of... Did... Do you you notice what he did? One of the first ways to move towards sin is to doubt what God has said. I mean, you read Genesis 1 and 2, and God said, 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 and God said. Chapter 3, verse 1. Did God really say... The serpent going to Eve, the woman. Did he really? Oh, he's good. 
getting Eve to doubt what God has actually said. And then did you notice the question he asks her? Did you notice that? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what God said? This is the audience participation portion of our program. Is that what God said? No. God said you can eat from any tree except one. And now the serpent comes along and says, did he really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Now Eve's about to correct him. We'll give her props. Eve's about to correct him. But get this, West Franklin. He's planted the seed. She has never thought that there might be restrictions yet. And now the way she's got to answer Satan, this serpent, is, wait, he may be keeping something from us. Not only does he get us to doubt God's word, but now he begins to get us to doubt God's motives. Huh, maybe God is keeping something from us. Look at how Eve responds to him. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. Way to go, Eve. Got it. Yes. It's the truth. It's what God said. By the way, God told Adam that. At some point, Adam, God love him, told his wife, don't eat from this one. And Eve said, no, 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 no. Here's what God said. But hear me, church, the thought is now there. Huh, God said I could eat from any but this one. Did God really say, does God really love, is God really good, or is he trying to keep something from us? West Franklin, every sin you've ever committed and every sin you'll ever commit is because you and I fail to trust God and his goodness. Everyone at the heart of it is you and I don't believe God wants what's best for us. Now Satan goes for the jugular. You ever wonder why he's called the father of lies? Verse 4, no, you won't die. The serpent said to the woman, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You lied. He's, he's just, he just lies. No, <laughs> you're not going to die. So cry out loud. Why would God kill you, his beautiful creation, for eating fruit? Go ahead and take your slice. God's not going to kill you. What did God say? You take it, you touch it, you die. Satan says, did God really say, you're not going to die? And then what does he do? Then he appeals to our human fleshly desires. He says he knows you'll be like who? God. Well, isn't it interesting? We're made in whose image? Y'all are on top of it. Made in God's image. But we always want a little more. We want to be... Like God. You say, well, I don't. That's kind of. You ever tried to control the situation? We always want to be like God because we want control. We want it our way. We want to tell God how to do his job. And that appealed to Eve. I may have this superior knowledge to where I can be like God, where I can call the shots. I can maneuver the outcomes. I can can make sure that the plans go according to my way. Oh, Wes Franklin, hear this. Every sin is doubting the goodness of God and wanting to take matters into your own hands. Whether a huge sin or a small sin, it's, it's believing the lie that God is, not, is out to get you and is holding something from you and now you got to go take what's not yours. That's sin. And if you think back to your last sin, probably a couple months ago, your last known sin, if you read the Bible characters throughout, you see the same thing. Did God really say? 
surely God wants me to have. I know he said this, but surely God wants me to. Maybe I'm supposed to take charge right now. I don't feel like waiting. And boy, when Eve decided it was time to sin, she just went for it. Look in verse 6 again. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. She took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Bam, 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 bam. That's what happens when you decide, okay, okay, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Uh, She looked at it. She desired it. She delighted it. She took it. She ate it. She gave some to Adam. Why did she give some to Adam? Because it's so much more fun to sin when you've got somebody to sin with you. You do it. It's not just me. But did you notice God had given them the entire garden? And what does the Bible say? She took it. She didn't receive from God. She didn't accept what God had given her. She took what didn't belong to her. She didn't trust God's goodness, trust God's provision. She took it. And perhaps you've asked the question, why this tree in the middle of the garden anyway? Why couldn't God just say, take it all? Think about it. There has to be a difference between us and God. We are made in his image, but we aren't God. And there has to be a way for us to show that we trust God. If there were no boundary, you and I would never have the opportunity to show that we trust God. At the root of sin, all sin, is your and I refusal to believe God is good for us. And we do it in our own. Tomorrow we celebrate, honor Martin Luther King, rightfully so, we should. That is honor worthy, his life and what he fought for. But if you think about it, he never should have fought, had to fight for it. There were a bunch of people who didn't like the way God had set up the world and wanted to take matters into their own hands and show other people who's in charge other than God. It's sin. It's not receiving the way God set things up and trying to orchestrate it your own way. It's the essence of evil and sin and disobedience. Now, after you sin, don't you feel just all warm and tingly inside? Oh, you want to go hide. You want to cover up. Y'all look at me like you've never sinned. Maybe it's just me. (laughs) Something happens. Isn't it interesting how Satan is the greatest cheerleader on your way to a sin, but the greatest condemner after you sin? Come on, you can do it. Yes, it's there for you. The second you sin, how could you do this? You call yourself, you went to church. You're a life group leader for crying. You're going to do, you're a pastor and you're going to. He's the greatest cheerleader on your way there. But the second you do it, he's the greatest condemner. What do Adam and Eve do right after? They go into the clothing business. Look in verse 7. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, we, we may laugh. We may, fig leaves, okay. And every time you see a picture book, <laughs> they're strategically placed. We get that. But did you notice what they're doing? The second they sin, not hours later, the moment they felt the weight of it, they felt the guilt, and they wanted to go hide. They wanted to cover themselves up. They wanted to hide themselves from one another and from God because that's what sin does. We want to try to cover up the bad parts now. We want to try to cover up the parts that we don't want to see. We want to edit ourselves in front of God and in front of one another. Sin dehumanizes us because we're made for this rich, intimate, loving, open, authentic relationship. And the second sin enters, we want to hide from one another and project something about ourselves that isn't true. And Adam and Eve do what, exactly what we do. We try to justify ourselves by clothing ourselves in certain ways that only people see the good parts. I hear, by the way, I've never worn fig leaves, but I hear, by the way, that they make you itchy and scratchy and cause a big 
rash. That's what I've heard. I don't even like figs. I don't like fig newtons. I tried one once and I thought I'm not going to waste my calories on a fig newton when they're Oreos. But anyway, <laughs> they clothe themselves with something that's never going to work. And I just wonder how many times you and I with each other and before God try to cover up and present an edited version of ourselves and try to justify ourselves. Look what I've done. Sin. If you find yourself in these verses, you're in good company. Every person sitting in this room has done four billion versions of Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Now, my time is up, but I have to ask this question and show you from Scripture. You're going to be home for the next four days anyway, so just give me a moment. How does God treat disobedient people? How does God treat people that spiritually look at him spit in his face and say I don't believe you I don't want that I want this and do it over and over put your eyes on verse 8 of Genesis 3 not our finest moment then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden so the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now there's so much that could be said here, but my goodness, aren't we good at playing the blame game? He just threw Eve under the bus. I mean, at the, I mean, it's crazy. At the end of chapter 2, he's singing songs about this woman. Flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. And then we get 10 chapters into chapter 3. This woman that you gave me, she made me do it. Isn't it nuts? I'm glad we aren't like this. She made me do it. And then God looked at Eve. Oh, the serpent made me do it. Blame, 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 blame. It's not my fault. We could talk a lot about blame. Probably should. But I want you to notice, what did God do? He went after them. He pursued them. He chased them. Wes Franklin, come in here real close. He could have gone on a mountain, sat on a throne, and said, I ain't going nowhere till they prove themselves to me and Satan would love to make you think that's the way God is but even after you blow it and then try to lie about it he goes after you he wants a relationship with you ma'am he wants a relationship with you sir that's why he made you and he's going to go after you even after you sin now, Wes Franklin, there are consequences to sin. We've already looked at that. And don't you think for a second there won't be consequences when you sin. There are consequences to sin. But you may be thinking, how could a holy God pursue a sin sinner like me? Something's got to be punished. Real quick, there's, a, there's three hints here in this chapter that show us what God does with sinners. How he makes it okay. First, put your eyes on verse 15. This is when God is giving the consequences to the serpent. Verse 15, he's, this is what he tells to the snake. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, I don't like, I don't like the way the CSB uses it because the language is stronger in the original, okay? But just notice, God is telling the snake, Satan, the serpent, our enemy, there's going to be a baby come from the line of Eve, from her offspring. There's going to be a baby. And this particular baby, the one I'm talking about, God's saying to Satan, you're going to, you're going to try to strike and you're going, to, you're going to be successful. You're going to strike his heel. But he's going to crush your head. 
That language there is much stronger than strike. It's destroy. It's crush. This child that's going to come from me, <laughs> you're going to nip at his heel, but he will crush you. Guarantee you that. And you turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus the Christ all the way back to Eve. And then if you'll keep reading, you'll notice that, that Jesus goes not into a garden but in a wilderness. And all the times that Adam failed, Jesus passed the test. There's one hint. God, what are you going to do with this sin? I'm going to crush the serpent. Look at another one. God didn't like their, their way of their clothing line. So he made his own. They put on uh, fig leaves. By the way, anytime you try to cover yourself before God, it will fail. Anytime you try to clothe yourselves and edit yourself and justify yourself in the eyes of God, it will fail. It's pointless. Verse 21. The Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife. And he clothed them. I don't like the fig leaves. Doesn't cut it with me. Let me give you some new clothes. First, leather pants. I don't know. It could have been cow. I don't know. What I want you to notice here is that an innocent animal had to die so they could be clothed. That animal hadn't done anything. God doesn't want your fig leaves. He wants to clothe you in what he provides. Jesus never once sinned so that you can be free to wear his righteousness. That Jesus never sinned innocent man who died you can be clothed with him last thing that I'm done Brad musicians wherever you are you can go ahead and start making your way up verse 24 now the consequence of sin he God drove the man out and stationed the cherubim and the flaming whirling sword east of the garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. It's weird. There's a sword flaming with fire guarding access back to intimacy and perfect relationship with God. In other words, if you're going to try to get back to God, you've got to go through the sword of divine justice and wrath. Can't do it. You're going to die. The only way it ha works is that if somebody, anybody, could go through it and then come out alive on the other side. In other words, you're not going to fix your sin problem. Your spouse isn't going to fix your sin problem. You're not going to fix your spouse's sin problem. Or your kids. If you're so sick of trying to get it right, I've got good news. You aren't going to fix it. Jesus fixes it. He's the one who went through divine justice even though he had done nothing wrong and came out alive on the other side. Adam represents us in our sin. Jesus represents us in righteousness. And it is enough. I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. And I'm going to invite you to respond. I know our time is long. We'll just take another minute or two. But it would be a shame for me to talk about sin and Jesus and not invite you to respond to the gospel. I'm going to be standing down here just a moment after I pray, and I want to invite you to come talk to me. Maybe you hadn't been in church in a long time. You, you think you, you came in here just sick of sin, didn't know why you sinned, and now you know a little bit why you sinned, but you heard of it. There's this Jesus that could fix you. I'd love to talk to you about that. If you don't want to come talk to me, maybe there's somebody that you came with that can help you. First service, there are several people that came to pray. Maybe you've been trying your best to fix your sin problem yourself. We church people are good at that. It won't work. 
There's only one person that can fix us, and that's Christ. The only one worthy. Jesus, would you come and help us respond in faith? Amen.